You're listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy Jones, and welcome to the Tremendous Leadership Leaders on Leadership podcast, where we pull back the curtain on leadership and talk with tremendous leaders from all over the world about what it takes to actually pay the price of leadership. And today, I am so excited to introduce our guest, Amy Scrignoli. Amy is the president and and CEO of Belco Community Credit Union and has a career in financial services that spans 25 years. She is passionate about learning, leadership, and believing in people. Amy has found that leadership is a very humbling experience and feels blessed to lead an outstanding organization with an amazing team of leaders. Amy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks for inviting me to have the conversation today. I think that um, this timeline being that it's at the end of November, it's a great time just to talk about gratitude. So I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your insights and you always bring interesting topics to the fore. So Thanks for sharing your father's leadership lessons with me once again. You are so welcome. And for our listeners, I always like to tell people how we connected. Amy's uh, one of my dear uh, friends and uh, just a role model for me and an amazing female leader in the central PA region. So we've known each other for many years and I'm president of her fan club, her Enola fan club branch. And I'm just, I'm so excited because she has quite the career and I'm so excited. She has a real servant's heart and uh, she has paid the price. So I'm excited to hear, especially especially from uh, an emerging uh, well-known female leader in the financial services uh, industry. Amy, what you have to say about the price of leadership. So thank you. And my father wrote this speech called The Price of Leadership. He wrote it decades ago. And he uh, loved leadership. And he was well known for his speeches on leadership. But he was very pragmatic about it. And what he mentioned is that you're going to have to pay the price of leadership. Leadership is not about a title. It's about actually getting in and doing the work. And there's a lot of tough stuff required for that. And as I'm sure Amy's going to share with us. But Amy, one of the prices of leadership that my father talked about in his book called The Price of Leadership He says, leadership is going to be lonely and there's going to be loneliness that you experience as a leader. And we've all heard that, well, it's lonely at the top, but can you share for me what loneliness means to you as a leader and maybe a word for our leaders that might be listening that may be in a season of loneliness? Well, Tracy, I got to say, I forgot how much I love this little read. It's a short read. It's a quick read. But um, Charlie says that um, being a student of leadership and not being, he speaks from a place of being a student of leadership, not being an authority on leadership. And I think that's one of the things that I find to be, that just resonates the most with me. It's a lifelong journey. So even though I'm 25 years into this career, I feel like I'm still learning different and new ways to lead. And part of that, as you've said, is you're going to, from time to time, go through these periods where you might experience loneliness. And I think that um, it's true. You need to be a very independent and confident leader, Mm -hmm. but you also need to understand that you're going to have to step outside of the pack sometimes. You're going to have to go it alone to try to achieve what it is that you want to get done or what you're trying to get done as the leader of your organization. So um, in this context, loneliness for me, I think is just doing the right thing because it's the right time to do it because it's the right thing to do and not necessarily because it's the popular thing to do because it isn't always the popular route to take. Right. And you as a leader are going to see things maybe at that other people don't see. And um, yeah, you're going to have to be the one sometimes to lead the pack. My dad, it's funny you mentioned that because what you were talking about reminded me of a quote he said. He said, you never see a monument in a park dedicated to a committee. You know, and I always laughed at that meaning, you know what, sometimes you are going to have to step out, step outside the pack. I love that. And how do you combat that when you're dealing with that? Well, I think you, um, you have to be sensitive to others. So um, be willing to ask the tough questions, but also be willing to listen to people and listen to what they, what they have to say. If, uh, you know, if you're going to take the road less traveled and assume some, some, some level of risk, you want to be willing to do that in a way that you're bringing others along with you. Right. 
I'm not well, alien. Well, you, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. We, are, we do sometimes have to step out apart from the pack, but the pack has to eventually come back with us. <laughs> otherwise, mm -hmm. otherwise, you don't have any, you're not a leader because nobody's, you're not leading anybody. So I truly appreciate that, that insight. One of, one of my mentors along the way shared with me um, that, you know, Amy, if you're not feeling a little discomfort, a little bit of a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach, then you're really not stretching yourself. You're not mm. growing. And if you feel that way, that's okay. Cause it's a sign that, you know, you're learning to lead. And I have felt that, that um, feeling in the pit of my stomach on more than one occasions. And I think, I think that is a, you know, a part of this lonely idea of loneliness too, is where, you know, you feel a little bit uncomfortable and different and not, uh, you know, you're not complying with the norm. You're not going along to get along, but you're trying to make a difference. Well, and I think that's why a lot of people shy away from leadership or when they get in the role, they realize, ew, there's some, there's some ickiness that I don't want to, I, I always go back to the office. You know, I love the office and I think about Michael Scott and how he just, he wanted to be everybody's friend, which is funny, but that's not leadership. Well, I guess my advice to anybody going through loneliness right now is just learn to lean into it and mm -hmm. grow into it. And eventually you just become accustomed to thinking differently or being a little different and having a little different mindset, but learning how, um, you know, how you're wired differently and how you can use that to, uh, you know, motivate your team and get your desired results. Okay. Well, I appreciate that word for our leaders out there because you are different, but you have a different title. You have, uh, you have a different mantle that you wear. And so um, I'm glad somebody said that to you when you were early on that, hey, you're going to feel this and don't be surprised when you do. And my dad did that too. He's like, hey, you're going to feel sometimes the loneliness. It's okay. If you don't, you're probably not doing it right. So I'm glad somebody somebody let you know that too, because it is unsettling and you wonder, am I doing this wrong? And there's a lot of leadership things out there that talk about, well, if you feel this, then, then you are doing it wrong. And it's like, no, not, not, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and how many times have you heard it's lonely at the top? Mm -hmm. And I think to a degree it is, but that's not your destination. That's just right. kind of part of the journey and it's not lonely at the top. If you can look around you and you've got, um, you know, you've got a peer group or you've got a team of people that come around you when you need them the most. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily think it's lonely all the time. It's just, it's a period, it's a season or it's part of the journey. I love that. Well, and can you talk to that as a CEO? Um, Cause you're in a unique position. Can you talk about, I know you have your co-leaders. I've met many of them and they, they got your back, but can you talk to me about the importance of a peer group at the C level and what that does for you to kind of combat? Cause there are times when you can't talk to anybody within the organization and you, you don't want to talk to your, you don't want to have pillow talk. You know what I'm saying? Um, but can you share how, cause you, you hit on that topic, the importance of that for you and dealing with loneliness. Yeah, I, I am so glad you asked that question because I think there's this really small group for me. It's less than five people probably mm -hmm. that you're just going to be, they're going to be your go-to people in the time of need. And it's a core group that I can go to for sage advice. And like you said, they're outside of my organization. They're outside of my team, my Belco team. They are kind of like my personal board of directors, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they're the folks that we share similar roles. Um, I feel really fortunate as a credit union CEO to have a strong peer group of other credit union CEOs that we come together, we serve on boards together, we collaborate on business. So it's a little different than what you might find in some other industries. Mm -hmm. But it's fantastic because I can go to them with a problem or an issue that I'm trying to wade through. I get ideas from them on best practices or, uh, you know, you get to run things by them. And it's a way for you to uh, re-energize, re-engage, get a different perspective, but you're not, um, you haven't damaged any of your credibility with your own team or uh, revealed your hand with your own team, so to, so to speak. 
I love that. That's a, that's a great insight. I love that last point because there are times when you may feel, but it's like, hey, uh, you know, in the military, we'd say that loose lips sink ships. You know, there are times when you need to keep stuff very close, close to the vest. Okay. So you hit on something just there where you talked about, you know, just the replenishment. The, the second price my father talked about was weariness. And, um, you know, it, it's tough. You especially have gone through the credit union, which is community-based interaction. And now with COVID and stuff like that, how do you combat weariness? How do you stay refreshed and replenished, um, not only as a person, but as a leader when your entire organization has shifted? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, um, that's funny because I, I go to that core group of folks and one of the questions that I ask in the middle of this uh, 2020 season that we're wading through is, does anybody else besides me feel like you have told everyone that you interacted today that it's going to be okay. We got this. We're in this together. But yet you're looking around like, hey, who's going to tell me that it's going to be okay? Who's going to tell me that we're going to get through this and it's going to be all right? And there are some days where you feel that way. But I think, um, you know, going to that core group of people is one thing. But I think there's also, and this is, this is going to sound cliche and maybe a worn out thing, but exercise, get, get outside of your four walls. Um, I know we're all supposed to be quarantining and staying away from each other, but go for a walk. I mean, one of those people on my board, I have to say is probably going to be Albert, my four legged friend, because he's a great listener. We go for long walks, we talk through things and we work it out. And, uh, I just feel like getting outside and getting engaged with the out of doors and, you know, just being, strong in my faith and, uh, you know, taking it to those core group of people is what I do day in and day out. And, you know, I started doing yoga again too. And mm -hmm. I forgot how much that makes me just feel physically better when I'm done. It's that breathing, that meditation and, uh, you know, and taking it to the Lord in prayer is an old hymn, but that is really, uh, true and important in this time that we're in. Well, I know you say cliche, but almost every leader that I have on here, and they've, they're the greatest leaders, have all said, if you don't take care of yourself, forget it, because it is taxing, and you have to do the self-care, and I love it, you know, the faith, the family, everybody talks about fitness, but I never thought about asking my dog what they think about <laughs> stuff. How strange. I mean, I really think that just talking that out with them, not just walking, because I'm not talking about business with them. Amy, you're really onto something here. He knows all my secrets. <laughs> I love that. And I'm sure just by the look, he can tell you, mm, don't worry about it. Or yeah, we, we might need to talk more about this. I love that. But no, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, that you need to stay at the top of your game physically because we're just mere mortals. And, um, and it does take a toll. And I think about that with COVID. I'm like, man, if I'm struggling, think about the less resilient people, how they're struggling. And uh, so it's just, it's just wonderful to monitor that. So thank you for that. Well, I know during COVID too, I mean, we've had to really cut out all the extras. So all those little nice things that we used to do together to meet up and have coffee or meet up and have drinks or go, let's go to lunch. I mean, all of that has been taken away from us because mm -hmm. of, you know, trying to be distanced and trying to keep each other safe that it really does um, allow you to focus on what's important. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe um, COVID forced that, but it's something that we should maybe think about carrying forward, about be more deliberate, be more present, and focus on what's important. Um, it's always important to kind of be willing to go that extra mile, but it's also, you, you've got to make sure you can go that extra mile and not get right. yourself overextended. Right, right. Right. And you have this community with the credit union. I've been a member of credit union since my Air Force Academy days. It is a community. And, and so are you finding that with your members too, that they miss seeing you guys? Because you know how much that interaction means. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. We hear from our members all the time that they're very happy and satisfied with our service and they love our people and they're happy that we're keeping everybody safe. But the biggest number one thing for them is that, Hey, I didn't get to go in to see my favorite, uh, my favorite teller Jenny or my favorite, um, you know, loan person that I always go to, to talk about my loan needs. And we just wanted to drop by and say hello because we miss seeing them. Mm -hmm. And I think that our members are our biggest supporters mm -hmm. and they 
let us know what we're doing is hitting the mark. Hey, we're able to get our transactions done. We're able to move our money around. We got what we need, but we miss you guys. And mm -hmm. you know, that's our message to them. We miss them too. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking forward to the day where we can just throw the doors back open and, you know, do business like we used to. And oh, I can't wait. I can't yeah. wait either. I, it's going to be, ex it's going to be exciting. No one's going to complain about standing in lines ever again. It's exciting. No. Exactly. I love it. Okay. So loneliness, weariness. Uh, the next price my dad talked about was abandonment. And that typically has a negative connotation, but his concept of abandonment was we need to abandon what we like and want to think about in favor of what we ought and need to think about. So it was much more of a hyper focus that, you know what, if you're really serious about success, you got, you got to get serious about eliminating the things out of your life that do not contribute to your success or even kind of pull you away. Can you share with me about how, how you really hone in on abandonment as a leader? Well, actually, I think I started getting into this on the last one. I must have been uh, working ahead here in my in my thought process. Um, I think it's interesting because I started on this one thinking about um, how do you create a space in your time, in your world, or in your mind for um, what matters? So mm -hmm. leaving things behind just has to become a part of it. Over right. time, you get so many invitations to participate on a board to contribute to a committee to have a, a mentor relationship mentor mentee type thing right um, all of these things really are things that you have to be able to commit to for a season but then you have to be able to say okay my work here is done and move on because if you don't you then become so log jammed and backlogged that you're really not able to to continue to grow to continue to recharge yourself and refresh so mm -hmm. that idea of abandonment while it might have a negative connotation it's really necessary to be successful as a leader because of the um you know the the volume of information that comes your way and the relationships that you have along the way um, you just are naturally going to outgrow and outpace some of them they're not all going to stick with you for a lifetime. They're with you for a season and for the season that it makes sense for you. And uh, it's not to feel bad about it. It's just to say, you know, that was a great experience. I took a lot from it. I was able to give a lot to it. But, uh, you know, maybe it's not part of who I am today or where I'm at in my life or the direction that I want to go or get to. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well, <clears throat> I call abandonment is kind of the great pruning you know if you want to explode uh, with new growth you, you got to look at it is there anything you know as you have shifted how you do business is there anything that you were doing before that all of a sudden you kind of look at and say do we really need to be doing this in in the new the new normal or our future because really COVID just change made what was going to happen the business of 15 years in the future happen now so anything that you kind of looked at and I, I like you was thankful that okay remember in april well march when it shut down in april is the month where there's an event every night including yours you know and i was looking forward to it but in a sense it was kind of like okay now that i don't have all that stuff to go to i can actually kind of focus on this how did that how did that work for you in running felco we have really just sat down here in the past couple of weeks to say okay look at all these meetings we're in meetings all day every day we need to sit down and take inventory of what we're meeting about and does this meeting still even need to exist so we're finding that now that we're in this COVID environment, in this pandemic environment, and we're all meeting by video and video chat, that some of our meetings really aren't necessary anymore. So as much as we want to try to hold on to getting back to our structure and getting back to where we were, we also recognize when we get back to doing the business in a more, I'll say, normal way, we're going to keep some of the changes that mm -hmm. we've made. Um, we're all doing daily huddles now with our team. So it's a quick hit, 15 minutes in the morning. Hey, what do you got going on? Do you have any bottlenecks uh, that you're experiencing? And what can I do to help you to alleviate that bottleneck? And we're, we've been doing that um, for years, but in the pandemic environment, we really picked up the pace. We're doing them every day and more teams are doing them. So, and everyone's really seen a huge value and a benefit from it. So we just continue to look at what are we doing today that's making a difference that we want to keep and what is it that we can jettison to kind of clear up the clutter and uh, be able to focus and be 
you know, have clarity as we get into 2021. I love that. And, and that's, that's kind of uh, the, the, the good side. Everything has a good and a bad side, you know what I'm saying? And so I love that you've been able to really look at that and say, hey, what is, what it, cause abandonment is really about what is the highest use of my energy and resources right now? in today's context. And I love that you've been able to share with that. And I think a lot of our leaders will be anxious to hear you say that because you're in a big organization that has this highly, like a lot of us are entrepreneurs and it's kind of like, what process? Every day, it's just kind of what happens. But for somebody like you, you still have to maintain that creative uh, future, which kind of takes me to the next point of vision. Mm -hmm. How do you, Amy, craft your vision uh, for seeing what needs to be done and then executing a, a plan to make it happen? Well, I think periodically carving out some time to um, look at the strategic direction mm -hmm. and say, okay, what did we accomplish? What have we done? Where are we at? So understanding the current environment and then taking that opportunity then to say, okay, where, where do we want to get to and how are we going to get there? And are we on the right path or do we need to make some course adjustments in what mm -hmm. we're doing? And uh, one of the things that I was thinking about here is just the idea of being able to reject apathy, where you're willing to step out, initiate change, and not just keep the status quo going, because that's what we've always done. Uh -huh. And I think we have an opportunity now because of this environment where we've been forced to change things that we didn't want to change we never thought we'd be able to work from home the way we're working from home now. So we want to reject the idea that, hey, we can't work from home and start to embrace the idea that hmm, some people can work from home if we support them with the right equipment, with the right uh, types of meetings and the right uh, software. So that setting direction and vision, I think, takes every now and then for you to just upset the apple cart and, uh, you know, just rebuild things back and see what you have and get that get that feeling for why are we here, understanding your why, and then building out your structure and your organization to be able to support that mm -hmm. so that you don't just keep doing what you've always done. And, and I think you have to watch, you don't get caught up in the idea of growing for the sake of growth that, oh, we need to get bigger. We need to get stronger. We need to get faster. Maybe you just need to get better. Maybe you just need to go back and reflect on what's my why, what are we trying to do here? Are we doing it? Are we doing it really well? And what could I change? What little things could I tweak to make it easier, make it more efficient and make it more meaningful? Oh my gosh. I feel I like know. you're speaking a word of prophecy to me. I love that. Do you need to get bigger or better? I mean, that's, that's the, the, the tension. And I always thought that was just because you're always with entrepreneurs. You need to grow. You need to grow. You need to grow. Do I? Do I? And how do I grow? I mean, I already have so much stuff. Do I need to keep buying more stuff to help me get bigger? I love that. Or do you just really need to focus in, hone in? And I, I think that's really getting clear. Clear. The clearer you get on your vision, you get really fine-tuned about, hey, this is exactly who I want to be and how I want to meet my members. And the rest is good, but it's not going to make the cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really do think too that we need to get good at focusing on strengths. And I'm a big proponent of that idea of strengths based leadership mm -hmm. where I don't have to be the expert. I don't have to know everything. I just need to know who to go to. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's building your strong team, building your army around you, building your peer group uh, or your board of directors, if you will, so that you know who to go to in a time of crisis and a time of need. And, uh, you know, that, that takes some planning and time and some, some commitment to building that over the years. It doesn't happen overnight. Absolutely. All right. So Amy, I love it. You said reject apathy. I was, did a podcast last week and somebody said, um, something about knowing what your kryptonite is, like, what are your triggers? And I forget what his was. It wasn't apathy, but it was like lazy, well, kind of apathy. You know what I'm saying? I tell people I'm lactose intolerant. I just, right. just. Figure out a way to do it. Stop complaining about it. That drives me just crazy, crazy insane. What do you do? What, how, do you, how do you get people to, because um, you're a leader, you get all kinds of people. You get people that, man, you know, the world could turn upside down and they're there, they're there. We'll figure it out, boss. Um, and other people that just, um, apathy seems to be like they're, they're part of their DNA. How do you as a leader, when you see the vision, how do you, how do you build that in? 
Well, I think uh, what you have to do is ask a lot of questions and try to identify who are your leaders mm -hmm. and who are going to be the individuals that are going to do something with their idea, with their thought, with what they see. Um, we're in the middle of uh, reading and doing a group book study on Pick Up the Gum Wrapper by Joe Bertato. Mm -hmm. And Joe talks a lot about strength-based leadership in there, but he also talks about finding the people who are willing to pick up the gum wrapper, not pitch the gum wrapper down, not walk past the gum wrapper, but be willing to pick up the gum wrapper because it's the right thing to do, because it needs to be done. And those are the people that you really want to seek out and find to be a part of your team, recognize and reward those individuals and, uh, you know, and try to avoid the apathy in the organization, you know, coach it up and out, I guess would be yeah. the best thing to do that. Well, I, and I, I love coach it up and out. And that's one of the other things. Hey, and another uh, a retired a rear admiral said that to me. Hey, if, if they just insist on that, then you just withdraw uh, responsibility and trust until eventually they're, they're outed from the organization because they put themselves in that. So I appreciate your, your authenticity and your transparency in that because anybody that's run people know that there's some people that are in and some people you could pay them a million dollars a day and it's just not going to work. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Agreed. All right. So Amy, what else? We've covered the four things on leadership, uh, paying the price of leadership. And I, I really thank you for your insights on each of them. Anything else um, that you would like to share from your leadership journey with our listeners? I think I would just say that, you know, you've got to continue to learn, to grow, to evolve and don't allow yourself to get stagnant. Don't allow yourself to, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the CEO now. I've arrived. I mean, leadership is not like a GPS. It's not going to say you, you've arrived at your destination. You'll never arrive at your destination if you're a true leader. You will continue to grow, evolve, and move past where you ever thought it was possible to go. So I guess I would just leave everybody with that is just be a lifelong learner, be willing to adapt, and be willing to put the work in because that's what it takes to be a great leader. I love it. Well, that's what my dad always said. If he had it to do over again, he wouldn't be Charlie Tremendous Jones. And you'll love this based on what, how you started. He said, I'd be Charlie Thankful Jones or Charlie Learning Jones. Because, you know, as much as he was known for leadership, he's like, every time I talk about it, I realize how, how little I truly know. And that's mm -hmm. who makes the best leaders. Exactly. Agreed. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Amy, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, I can be reached at my email, which is my last name, hard to spell, but uh, it's Scrignoli and the letter A at Belco, B-E-L-C-O dot O-R-G, or they can give me a call at 717-654-8205. So either one of those would be great. I love it. And for our listeners out there, we will make sure to check out the show notes at the bottom. We'll have Amy's, all the things that she has talked about to include the book she referenced, Joe Portado's book. I didn't know about that. That doesn't surprise me. Joe's incredible. I'm going to check that out. And, um, and all, all the notes so you can get in touch with Amy. So Amy, I just want to thank you so much for being a part of our Leaders on Leadership podcast and for inspiring leaders and for pouring into me and our listeners today. Thank you, Tracy. It's always great to talk with you. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And today's no exception. Thank you, Amy. To our tremendous listeners out there, if you like what you heard, please be sure to ring that bell, hit the subscribe button wherever you listen. Also, we'd be honored if you would do us the solid of a five-star review. Also, leave us a note. We answer all our comments. And if you go over to TremendousLeadership.com or at the bottom of the show notes, you can download a free copy of The Price of Leadership where you can get that little life-changing classic that will change your life. It's a little gem, as Amy said, and it's a quick and powerful read. So to our tremendous family out there. Thank you for being a part of our tribe. Thank you for being the leaders so many people need to see. Thank you for paying the price of leadership. Have a tremendous rest of the day. Thank you for listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Find out more about Dr. Jones at www.tremendousleadership.com. If you've been ignited by something you heard in this episode, let us know by leaving a review for Tremendous Leadership wherever you listen to podcasts or by sending us a message through www.tremendousleadership.com.